Hollywood Buddhism. I'll just give a little bit of uh, context. You know, if you think about all the many Buddhisms that have emerged, the um, three traditions and modern Buddhism and um, post-traditional Buddhism and global Buddhism or Western Buddhism or engaged Buddhism. Um, and now it seems that we have this, uh, what's it called, a wave of secular Buddhism and um, which seems to raise uh, quite a thorny complex of um, set of issues. And uh, so let's consider, you know, all these issues of cultural adaptation, um, dilution or um, distortion, or is it a sort of a fresh air of uh, reason and um, necessary institutional reform, unnecessary ind independence for the individual and for communities. Um, for some, you know, secularism provides relief from the co cognitive and cultural dissonances of holding contradictory views or beliefs or of participating in strange rituals. Um, or it enables an individualised approach to spirituality or a more democratic or participatory approach in Sangha life. And does secular um, Buddhism allow us to get on with the concerns of this life right now? So it seems that, you know, if you look around all the, um, the debates that the issues that are emerging are around power and authority, around the grounds or the basis of um, knowing, you know, whether it's tradition, faith, belief, reason, experience. Some raise the question of what is essential Buddhism, and others say, watch out for essentialism. So, you know, these are the sorts of issues that have emerged. Some might be concerned that uh, that there's a Western ideology being imposed in a form of colonialism on what real or authentic Buddhism is as it is traditionally practiced. And there's all sorts of discussions about what is the baby and what is the bathwater. Mm -hmm. so, but, you know, as we kind of read the, the debates and as you see online, um, there seems to be uh, quite a bit at stake and there seems to be uh, certain intensities arising. And I notice for myself, you know, I, can, I tend to sit in the middle and take quite an agnostic, non-sectarian view and I find myself leaning this way and that. And I'm thinking, you know, here I am in the middle, but am I in a muddle in the middle? And um, so I'm kind of hoping that tonight's debate is going to bring some clarity and insight. Um, so with, uh, in preparing for tonight's debate, uh, we do have a bit of a list of things that um, Dante and Winton and I tend to agree upon, and you'll find that these are sitting around, and if you'd like to have a look at them, so that we're trying to sort of, um, I suppose, contain the discussion in some way, maybe things that we don't really have to discuss tonight, but you never know. So if you'd just like to have a look at those. Um, so now I think I'll just uh, introduce our two, um, let's say our two contestants that are watching too much TV. So, um, so I'd like to introduce Venerable Sabato and um, I have the pleasure of uh, teaching with um, Bante and the ADCAP, the um, Australian Association of Buddhist Counselors and Psychotherapists in the training program. That's very enjoyable time with my okay. And um, so, can't hear me? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's good. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so, Bhante was ordained in the forest uh, tradition lineage of Ajahn Chah. And since 1994, he's been practicing meditation in forest monasteries in Thailand, Malaysia, and Australia. 
He specialises in historical research into the fundamental te teachings found across the Buddhist traditions. His books include A Swift Pair of Messengers, A History of Mindfulness, Beginnings, and Sect Sex and Sectarianism, and he is about to publish another book which will be uh, on the web next week, his promises, and um, on the uh, monastery website, and I think on his blog, and you'll be able to download this for seventeen dollars, oh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. And so this is white bones, red rot, black snakes, and uh, Buddhist mythology of the feminine. And on the back it says it's a subversive read. So <laughs> strongly encourage you to have a look at that. Um, and also what I know of Bhante is that he used to be a rock and roll musician, some other life. <laughs> and um, so this sort of suggests that temperamentally Bhante is inclined not to be shy in coming forward about certain things and doesn't shy away from um, controversy perhaps. Um, could say he's a reformer and I don't know if he'd say he's a revolutionary. I don't know. No, see it's starting to come out now. Um, but he was deeply involved in the uh, ordination of women, so there you go. Something very significant and important happened with Dante's um, contribution. So, and now Winton. I've known Winton a long time, so we'll wait. And um, <clears throat> so Winton is. Uh, currently a visiting research fellow at the Transforming Cultures Research Centre at ETS. After a very long academic career of 40 years, mainly in political sociology and theory, and he says he's an enthusiast for Bastille Day observance. Today being Bastille Day, very fitting for having this debate. And um, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, that given such a, a background in political critique and challenging authority and supporting social justice, that if you were inclined to believe in rebirth, then uh, you might be led to think that Winton might have been one of those characters back then, storming the Bastille on this very day. So, <laughs> um, so Winton has been practicing the Dharma for 25 years teaching it and leading retreats for the last 16 years. These days he mainly teaches uh, retreats in the sort of recollective awareness mode. He chaired the management committee of What Buddha Dharma for five years in the later 1990s and uh, he's one of the founding parents of SIM and he stays closely aligned with this. One of the regular teachers at Blue Gum, Golden Wattle and the Beaches. <laughs> and with David Bugmalitic, he's uh, currently editing a special issue of um, on secular Buddhism for the Journal of Global Buddhism. So I'll now hand you over to Winton to sally you forth. Thank you, Lizzie. Oh, is this working? No. Gosh. Is this working? <laughs> um, yes, well, uh, given my in enthusiasm for Bastille Day observance. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the citizens of Paris in 1789 <laughs> uh, and um, the Marquis de Condorcet, whose words have been up on the screen, the main drafter of the French Declaration of uh, Rights, um, and I guess Thomas Jefferson, who was actually standing right behind him in person as he was drafting it. So. Uh, there you go. Um, I just thought I'd give an orientation to secular Buddhism so we know basically what we're talking about. Uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a school, there is no canon, there is no orthodoxy, there is no particular institutional presence, um, so I can't pretend to be a representative of it, I can just um, present myself humbly as a specimen of dubious representative value. <laughs> um, 
Now, secular Buddhism is a recent uh, small star in a rather older and crowded galaxy, known usually in the literature as Buddhist modernism. Uh, like Donald Lopez these days calls it modern Buddhism, but I think you can just take your pick about the terminology. And this uh, story of Buddhist modernism goes back 150 years. It probably started in Sri Lanka uh, as a um, strategic response to the encroachment of uh, missionary Christianity, and particularly Protestant missionary Christianity. Uh, so uh, it actually decided to uh, learn a few tricks from the missionaries. And really that's how it began. It moved from Sri Lanka to, or it spread from Sri Lanka to Japan and Burma and uh, Thailand and eventually to probably the rest of um, Buddhist Asia. So uh, basically Buddhist modernism, of which secular Buddhism is a part, has three themes that are probably usually fairly universally recognised as defining. Uh, and they all these themes come from the encounter between uh, uh, the West, the encroaching West through imperialism or missionary activity, uh, and the Asian cultures that were uh, trying to neutralise or roll back this, um, this wave, uh, at the same time learning something from it. So these three, uh, these three elements that really define the origins of Buddhist modernism are firstly Protestantism itself, and its focus on individuation, the inner life, the dignity of lay practice, uh, the curtailing of priestly privilege, uh, and the relative downgrading of uh, ritual. The second the second element is rationalism uh, and scientific nation, uh, naturalism. I suppose you can say this is the, uh, the legacy of the European Enlightenment. And it had a tendency, it still has a tendency, I guess, uh, the negative tendency of the disenchantment of the world, as um, Schiller put it and Weber made more famous. And the third element is romanticism. Uh, which in Western culture was a countervailing influence to the Enlightenment. And uh, this, uh, if you like, seeks to re-enchant the world with, uh, by highlighting um, emotions, honouring emotions, emotional life, the imagination, and the mysterious. Now, um, David McMahon, in his recent really good book on Buddhist modernism, uh, talks about the two emphases that these three influences brought into the Buddhist world, um, and um, which are of course very much expressed in uh, in Western culture. And the first one is the emphasis on living this transitory, everyday, earthly life well, the idea of the good human life and not pining for some later or other life in some other place or sphere of existence. And the second one is the shift away from outward forms and ritual towards the inner life, the inner search, what philosophers call interiority, uh, reflexivity, uh, the idea of being self-conscious, being aware uh, of uh, oneself in a critical way, and so there's the idea of self-scrutiny. So those are the two emphases, I think, that, um, that colour Buddhist modernism. Uh, I guess in brutal summary, we might say that Buddhist modernism came to life within or, within, or in some proximity to pre-modern <coughs> religious forms of Buddhism. Uh, but over time, as the modernism aspect intensified, the relationship between Buddhist modernism and pre-existing religious forms or inst religious institutions became more and more attenuated, until today we reach a point where there's, uh, within the kind of, I suppose, the avant-garde of Buddhist modernism, there are two uh, contrasting approaches. One is the approach of saying, let's just bail out altogether. Uh, and you know, we've learnt a lot.
got from the Dharma, uh, but we really don't want to take responsibility for representing it uh, or being part of it. So we call ourselves things like post-Buddhism, uh, or recently uh, Glenn Wallace, who's a very really considerable scholar in this area, uh, has invented what he calls speculative non-Buddhism. <laughs> um, but uh, both these elements are they're, they're respectful, uh, they stay in touch, uh, but they simply uh, find uh, the, you know, all the debates around authentic versus inauthentic Buddhism, etc., just a bit tedious and a bit uh, murky. And uh, what they're really interested in is taking what's useful from the Buddhist tradition. Now, secular Buddhism uh, is the second approach, which is saying we want to stay in the tradition. Uh, so, to my mind, what is often missing in all these discussions is what exactly does that mean? What is the tradition? And here I'm, uh, I want to pin this down for tonight's discussion in particular. And uh, I'd like to rely on uh, the living moral philosopher Alistair McIntyre's approach to what a tradition is. Essentially, McIntyre's point is that any practice worthy of the name, uh, whether it's dent dentistry, architecture, accounting, or spiritual practice, meditation, every practice is held and informed by a tradition. And that tradition will either be living or dead rather stark way of putting it. Some other philosophers talk about reactivated traditions versus sedimented traditions. But they're making the same sort of distinction. Now, a living tradition uh, is one in which um, the present practitioners know how the tradition began. So uh, a living tradition is usually one in which there's a founder, might be very remote in time, like the Buddha, who asked certain foundational questions and proposed certain uh, provisional answers uh, and developed a practice around uh, the sort of uh, questions and answers that she or he was posing. Uh, so that's where the tradition begins. And subsequent generations then carry the responsibility of refining the questions, uh, refining the answers, being creative around new questions and answers, and, uh, and of course, uh, thinking up new ways or reformed ways of practicing the tradition of informing uh, the practice. Uh, so that, all that, of course, requires a, a practice community, uh, one that is uh, dedicated to the practice and one that is dedicated to study uh, and to debate. In other words, listening receptively uh, to alternative views and uh, articulating one's position clearly. So it's a sort of intergenerational conversation. A dead tradition, on the other hand, is one in which, uh, in the present time, uh, the, uh, the present day practitioners don't know how the tradition began. They don't know what the formative or the generating generative questions were, and they don't know how the conversation has developed since uh, since the beginning, and therefore they're in a position that they can only preserve what they've inherited. They don't really know uh, the laws of motion whereby the tradition can be reactivated, uh, revivified. Uh, in other words, the uh, uh, the possibility of uh, of renewal. So, um, secular Buddhism is trying to um, reactivate or renew, renovate the tradition as um, every generation of practitioners has the responsibility to do. And the word secular itself, and I think this is very important, the word secular comes from the Latin word saculum. And saculum originally meant uh, a human lifespan. It uh, gradually took on a slightly larger meaning of a century. So we get the French word siècle, which comes from it, which means precisely a hundred years. And uh, so the focus of, uh, of the secular approach is 
to, in particular in Buddhism, is to become as informed as possible about the Buddha's cyclum, uh, the socio-economic conditions, the intellectual culture, the religious culture, etc., that uh, that really uh, moulded him, that he would have encountered growing up in the Gangetic Plain in the 5th century BCE. Uh, so we want to ask questions like, uh, having known this and having access to the suttas in particular, we want to know questions like this. What did the Buddha actually teach? Uh, even the most literate reading of the Pali texts can only take us so far. Who was he actually talking to? I mean, obviously, uh, in the suttas and indeed uh, a lot of the primary material in the Vinaya, the Buddha is talking to someone. It's a dialogic approach in his teaching. So who is he talking to? What did they want? Why did they listen to him? What did they understand him to be saying? Because he was obviously a master of communication. So uh, he presumably uh, chose to express himself very carefully. He knew how to pitch uh, his message to the particular audience that he was speaking to. And what was it that the Buddha and his audience would have regarded as so self-evident that there was absolutely no reason for anyone to really comment on it, but which we wouldn't see as self-evident at all? And so how would his audience have understood uh, his teaching? So these are all sorts of questions, I guess, that secular uh, Buddhists are interested in. They're interested in, in becoming as informed as possible about the Buddha's cyclum, uh, as well as uh, having the most sensitive possible understanding of our own cyclum. And so uh, knowing how to recommit uh, to the Buddhist tradition in ways that are meaningful to our time and place. So I guess that's the, um, you know, this is the remit <laughs> of secular Buddhism. And I just want to give uh, quickly six ways in which secular Buddhism may uh, differ or may vary from other uh, uh, expressions of Buddhist modernism. So the first one is a close study of suttas in the historical context of the Gangetic Plain in the 5th century BCE and the Buddha's own life story. Uh, there's a very heavy emphasis on uh, looking at the Buddha's uh, biography uh, and various attempts have been made in the last 50 years, starting with Nyanamolis, uh, which looked almost exclusively, or exclusively at the Pali texts and uh, commentaries, to uh, the works of people like Pankaj Mishra, uh, Stephen Batchelor, and um, John Strong, who have produced some sort of first drafts, if you like, of the Buddha's own biography. Uh, the second point is the absence of ritual and of formulaic meditation practice uh, and an open and exploratory approach to practice informed by Sutta study and the current conversation around Dharma practice. The third differentiating point is a preference for small sanghas and other practice communities, ones which embody progressive principles of association, um, flat democratic uh, types of organisations, organisations that are inclusive, egalitarian and diverse. The fourth one is a critical eye on large scale religious institutions, past and present, and of their products. Uh, there's a considerable um, sense of how powerfully institutions um, render and indeed bend out of shape uh, original teachings to meet their own institutional requirements and fit into their own institutional dynamics. The fifth point uh, is that the ethical commitments that already inhere in the tradition, like the five precepts or uh, the six perfections, are expanded out to encompass those ethical issues that are so important for us today uh, around things like world peace, um, environmental sustainability, 
social justice, human rights, and gender equality. Some of which the French revolutionaries got right and uh, others they were neglectful of. And the sixth and final point I want to make in this differentiation is um, receptivity to resonances in our own secular culture um, that I think powerfully complement uh, the Dharma itself. And I'm thinking in particular of um, those, uh, those currents like ancient Greek uh, thought, both the, the tragic and comic traditions and the philosophical traditions, uh, the uh, 19th and 20th and 21st century <coughs> currents of continental philosophy, particularly phenomenology and existentialism, and, uh, and classical psychoanalysis. Uh, these, the focus of all these, as with the Dharma, is on the human condition. And to me, this is what is central to the Dharma, this is central to, what the, to these other traditions. The human condition, with its uh, tragic structure, uh, its discomforts, uh, its finiteness, its possibilities, and its responsibilities, all mediated through our unique human consciousness. So I'll leave it at that. I uh, hope that orientation is helpful and hand it back to uh, the citizen chair. Okay, so I'll just hand it over to Dante for your response. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, Winton, that's very, uh, <coughs> very clear. And one of the things that strikes me immediately about that is that you made this point of what distinguishes secular Buddhism from Buddhism modernism generally, but I don't think that actually many of those points I don't think really actually distinguish secular Buddhism as such. I and mean, certainly the first one about the, the study of the Buddha's biography uh, has been going on uh, long before there was anything we know of as secular Buddhism. Even the, for example, the forms of the Buddha biography, <coughs> for example, which is standard in Thailand is derived from a text called the Patama Sambodhi, which I'm not sure how old that is, maybe a couple of hundred years old. Uh, and that's the basis. Like if you go to a Thai temple, you'll see the pictures on the walls of the Buddha's life and so on. And that's all, we, we see that as a very, lots of miracles and the Buddha walking on lotuses and so on. But that's actually already a rationalized version of the Buddha's life, uh, which has already taken out quite a lot of the miracles and supernatural elements which are found in older, Versions, so that process has been going on already for a long time. So to me, that seems rather a continuation of the Buddhist modernist project, rather than something which would differentiate it from it. I don't know what you think about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, these points of differentiation are often matters of emphasis, but one of the things that's coming up. Uh, in looking at the Buddha's circulum now, uh, it's quite probably quite different to uh, the friezes and reliefs on the Thai temples. Is getting right away from right away from Ashvagosha's sort of Hollywood account of, of the Buddha's <laughs> life. Hollywood rather, <laughs> Hollywood uh, account, even though it was uh, early second century of the Common Era. Um, and looking at things like uh, the socio-economic conditions, I think one point that really interests me as a, you know, an old political economist is that uh, the Industrial Revolution was occurring, which was causing enormous upheavals uh, in uh, the Buddha's world, you know, and he was... Uh, industrial, the, industrial Revolution. The, sorry, the, the Agricultural Revolution. The Agricultural Revolution, which meant a lot of mobility, <coughs> a lot of social mobility, urbanisation, and a lot of existential issues uh, that, um, and and uh, and the spread of ideas uh, that um, conditioned the Buddha really made the Buddha's uh, appearance possible. And it was uh, precisely those sort of ideas that um, also produce what is often called the first beginning of Western culture in Greece at the same time. And so it's the it's it's that kind of approach that looking at what was going on, what were the 
socioeconomic, uh, what was the socioeconomic turmoil about, what were the new classes, the new social conditions, uh, how come there were people asking all these questions about suffering, and, uh, and so on. So it's that sort of thing. It's not so much looking at the Buddhist family and uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, but it is actually looking at the conditions that gave rise to the original Dharma. Mm, sure. And I mean, in many ways, you mentioned that parallels with, with Greece and so on, but it also is, is uh, very characteristic of the axial age philosophies generally, a lot of things you're mentioning about inferiority and so on and so forth. Again, again, I, I'm seeing these more as, as kind of general um, general tendencies in, you know, found in a very wide variety of movements and so on and so forth. Uh, so fair enough, I made the point about emphasis, but I'm still kind of looking for what what is what, what really kind of distinguishes um, the secular Buddhist approach. Yeah, I'll just give I'll just give one example. So we we step away from generalities a little bit. So for example, one of uh, Bachelor's arguments that he gave. Now correct me on this because I haven't read all the details. I just read an interview with him about it. But he gave one art argument about the Buddha and Mara. Yeah, and have you, have you read that? The book he did on that? It's a whole book, yeah. It's a whole book. I haven't read the book, I've just read an essay about it. So, uh, but, the, but the basic argument, if you correct me if I'm wrong, was that <clears throat> the Buddha obviously had all of these conversations with Mara, right? And, uh, well, some of these conversations happened after the Buddha was enlightened. So, if Mara was the deluder, does that mean that the Buddha was still deluded after his enlightenment? So I believe this is a question that Stephen Batcher is asking. So it's, it's a very important question, which is like, how absolute is that notion of enlightenment? Yeah? And it's, it's, it's a fundamental question in Buddhism. What, what is the nature of enlightenment? Can somebody who's enlightened have deluded thoughts? Not a new question by any means. I mean, the, it's one of the basic uh, controversies of the five uh, points, which was behind the first schism. What's, it, what's, what's the actual nature of the knowledge of someone who's enlightened? So that's one of the fundamental questions of Buddhism, actually. So, so he raises this question and discusses it, and I think it's a very interesting and very useful one. But my impression, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, was that he, 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 he argued that, well, essentially, Mara is either a deva, like a, an objectively existing spirit, or a psychological phenomenon, yeah? Of course, in, the, in Buddhist tradition, Mara can be both. Mara is interpreted in both ways. Um, but he's arguing since, presumably, I guess he doesn't believe in Mara as the objectively existing deity, therefore it must be a psychological phenomenon. And so this conclusion, therefore, is reached that, he, that the Buddha's enlightenment was still deluded after his enlightenment. Yeah? Perhaps, to some degree. And... I mean, that's, so, so that point, right, when we get to that point, we're, we're talking about something which is a lot more shocking and a lot more pulling right at the heart of what it means to be a Buddhist than we are simply if we ask sort of questions about, well, you know, what was the nature of the culture at the time of the Buddha or something. We're saying that the Buddha was still deluded yeah, and that he wasn't really fully awakened in the sense that the Buddhist community thinks he is. It seems to me that that argument, if I've represented it right, yeah, I find that argument very naive. Because it seems to me that that what we're talking about is stories, and it seems to me there's this tendency to say, well, Mara must be an objectively existing thing, which is either a deva or a psychological state. Whereas to me, it's not. It's what is a story, and we can't infer from that story in any straightforward way either to, you know, an objectively existing spirit or to a psychological state. But we can infer to the nature of storytelling techniques which we used at the time of the Buddha. Um, I don't think he's, uh, his idea of uh, Mara is quite like that. Ah. Um, he's, he's, he sets up the idea of Mara as representing, as, as being a kind of personification of evil and evil understood as darkness. So, um, you know, we have, if you like to put it in Heideggerian terms, you know, we have being and we have forgetfulness of being. And um, 
and it is the human condition uh, to uh, to be to be constantly dragged back into certain kinds of uh, mental states or to have certain kinds of mental events, uh, and in and awake. Awakening is a process, and it's a process that constantly needs to be renewed. And this seems to be the reason why uh, the Buddha went on practicing like the clappers um, long after he was awakened. So awake, this idea, of, I think the problem is, the idea of um, enlightenment as a status rather than awakening as a process. So the Buddha was constantly practicing after his in the first awakening experience to uh, to renew that process and Mara kept coming I mean Mara was essential to the Buddha's practice uh, if Mara didn't keep cropping up uh, to, uh, to, to tempt the Buddha into forgetfulness of being then the Buddha wouldn't have kept practicing and then we wouldn't have had those wonderful dialogues that we have uh, between uh, Mara and the Buddha and the one that I uh, love is, you know, when the Buddha was very old uh, and, you know, was getting up very early in the morning to meditate and, uh, and Mara says, you know, as usual, presenting himself as this kindly stranger coming with a little bit of good advice saying, you know, you're an old man now, you've done a lot and um, you've achieved a lot, you don't have to keep going like this, you know, you can, uh, you, know, you can put your feet up and relax back, and the Buddha then comes up with the famous line of uh, one should practice as if one's hair was on fire. Now, why why would one do that if one <coughs> had attained a status uh, from which, which was irreversible and um, without taint and all the, all the other ritualistic expressions around it? I really think what was going on was the Buddha was, um, uh, was enacting the uh, awakening human experience, dealing constantly with uh, the pressure of, of the human condition. I mean, I guess in today's language we would say we, were, we, are, we are hardwired uh, to have certain reactions and responses and, we, and, and it's part of the practice of each one of us to become aware of it and to counteract it. Can, can I just, oh, I'm just curious about the way you're um, bringing out this aspect of this is a story because it seems to me that you, your mind is already quite a sophisticated mind that approaches this um, issue. And so you already uh, seem to be predisposed to thinking, oh, this is a story. So perhaps you already have the capacity to, um, to reflect in a more psychological way and that there would be others who would not necessarily um, <coughs> understand the narrative structure of what's being presented, and that they would be, um, through some learning or other conditioning, be predisposed to thinking that there is an arrival, there is some place at which we arrive, some enlightened state, and there is a sort of a fantasy that's driving that. Uh, kind of. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to... I, I think there is a... I don't think it's a fantasy. I think there is an awakening. I think the Buddha was awakened on the night of his enlightenment. And I don't think he, he further developed in practice after that. But I think that there are stories which you know illustrate things of importance to the Buddhist community. Yeah? Um, and you know, the, 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 the kinds of issues, when, 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 you know, you know, when you said that the Buddha keeps on practicing, yeah, he kept on meditating, but you know he said so many times, you know, he's he's accomplished what has to be done. I mean, these are the the basic statements, you know, katakicham, you know, I, this is I finished my practice, I realized full enlightenment, and all of these things he's saying quite clearly and definitively and explicitly again and again and again. Uh, so, from my point of view, purely as a as a text critical scholar, yeah, I mean, I say, well, you know, these these are clearly meant to be definitive, straightforward statements of fact, right? They could, they're not, we're not talking about you know, metaphors and parables and things like that. These are things which are put right there at the center. And you can't throw out those often repeated definitive statements on the basis of some parables and stories and so on, which may be 
who knows? It may be a, 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 you know, a, just a, a way of telling a story, or could be could be whatever. Uh, but you know, that, that, that comes back to 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 this idea that, that the the use of the figure of Mara primarily, what we have is a story. Yeah, a actually, that's all we have is a bunch of words which tell a story. Yeah? So anything we met, we infer from that about the nature of the Buddha's enlightenment and so on is secondary. The thing that there, what are the stories that are a fact, and what are the stories of myth? You know, how how are you going to distinguish? Oh, well, the ones that are fact have footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not just a joke, yeah. Mm. The, the core fact that there's a form to it, mm. yeah. That there is, there is, there, are, there is a literary way mm. in the texts which will dis distinguish and allow you, to, you know, using fairly common sense kind of mm. guidelines to know well what's the difference between a, a parable which illustrates a certain point mm. and something which is intended as a, a you know, a clear statement of, of teaching. Uh, well. Um, I guess from the point of view of secular Buddhism, um, which I said I'm a, a, a quite um, appropriate representative, <laughs> uh, we, there, there is a sort of, there, there is a very strong sense, I guess, of awakening as a process. It is something that is going on in our practice, uh, particularly during intensive periods. And, and it isn't, a, there isn't a, um, there isn't an end point where it's all done and dusted, and um, and you know I, I guess there's a there's a lot of people who regard the the stories of Mara's constant return right up to the point uh, of the Buddha's death as as really showing that um, as long as one is a human being, uh, there's work to be done. And I know Robert it was one of the things that Robert Aitken Roshi used to say that. He could imagine uh, Shakyamuni Buddha sitting up there in the heaven of the 33 gods, still puzzling over this conundrum about human consciousness. <laughs> and, and I guess that's more my sense of, uh, of what practice is about. There is no, there is no terminus. And I guess this, this raises, if we cut to the chase now, um, there's, uh, I think, one of probably the big arguments between secular Buddhism and, dare I say, more religious and more soteriological uh, can, uh, strands of the Dharma uh, is the idea of transcendence or non-transcendence. Uh, so I, I think a lot of secular Buddhism these days is um, pretty much influenced by a parallel development within Christian theology, uh, particularly uh, someone like Paul Killick, uh, who's strongly influenced Stephen Batchelor among others, uh, and um, Lloyd Geary, who uh, see, who, who really dismiss the idea of transcendence. And it really is about um, human development, about the human condition, the human potential. I mean, Tillich saw God as not being a separate entity at all. He was a Lutheran minister. Um, but denied uh, the existence of God as a separate entity, and there's a whole bunch of uh, Christians now who are doing the same thing. And I guess the parallel development within secular uh, secular Buddhism uh, is to uh, is to see that whatever whatever it was the Buddha uh, achieved by way of uh, process and by the way of the way in which he actually lived his life, his being in the world. Uh, it was a human achievement, and, um, uh, and and it was contained within a human life. Could, could I just, can you just clarify a bit more about what you think transcendence is in Buddhism? Just outline it, the features of it. Well, um, one of the things that is very central to secular Buddhism is to um, 
understand something about its history. And of course, what the Buddha was born into uh, a religious culture that was heavily soteriological, as the experts say. In other words, it was based upon a concept of redemption and transcendence. But the idea that you know that the the uh, the Atman, uh, soul, spirit, whatever you like, um, after countless lifetimes would gradually merge with uh, with the Godhead, and that would, that would be a transcendence, uh, a, a going beyond the human condition. And uh, so, you know, it's, uh, for instance, Stephen Batchelor's interpretation, which I would agree with, that uh, the Buddha broke out of that whole, uh, that whole problematic, to produce something that was uh, that was that really strongly criticised that whole idea of salvation and transcendence in some other realm. But after his death, um, the gravitational pull of this very developed soteriological tradition in India drew uh, religious forms of, of the Dharma back into the whole soteriological problematic. And that's where we get this idea of, you know, uh, it, it will either uh, you know, extinction in the Theravada tradition or, you know, those other lovely stories that the Mahayana tells us. The problem, the problem I look into is that there's no, and I, I can't see any like serious text critical or history, historical basis for actually arguing that on, the, on, on what's actually found in the Pali Canon and through the comparative study with the Chinese arguments. And on, on the contrary, what you find when you do that, and especially when you do the comparative studies, is that what, t what, what is reinforced through text critical study is those uh, basic fact, or not facts, but basic statements of Dharma, yeah? the kind of the, the, the tropes or the, 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 the cliches, if you like, of the, the repeated, you know, the, the, the arahant who's the one who's done what Thing needs to be done, has lived out the holy life and so on. Now, these kinds of things repeated again and again, found in tradition, all the way across the traditions and so on. Whereas things like the stories of Mara and so on, yes, some of them we find across the traditions as well. We certainly find the same kind of thing across traditions. But as the stories tend to be much more varied. So as far as I can see, the, the text critical evidence suggests that it's the, the, the legends and parables and so on which tended to be the things that were elaborated, whereas the, you know, the basic Dharma formulas, Four Noble Truths and so on and so forth, tended to be fixed at quite an early date. So to me, the, the, the historical evidence just doesn't support that kind of model. Well, as we all know, and we agreed upon in the uh, things we agreed well, on, is that the... Uh, is that the um, the Pali canon and the Agama literature, of course, cannot be taken as a, a true and accurate record of what actually happened. That it's that these texts have been in the hands of people uh, many, many centuries who uh, lived and breathed the soteriological account of the Dharma. Um, the other thing is that, of course, if you that you can look at lots and lots of texts where the Buddha is. Using, he's using the language of Brahmanism in an ironic way. It's a point that Richard Gombrich uh, in particular emphasises. And we can see that he's actually, um, uh, I mean, what one actually we were using 48 hours ago in, uh, in sort of study at uh, Bluga was uh, where the Buddha was um, talking about his initial reluctance to teach. Uh, and he says people are um, people are so attached to their place, to their area. Uh, and you know, we, all, we can understand that their modern terms, their laden self, their um, hab their habitus, uh, what they're familiar with, they're attached to the familiar, and and therefore they are not. The Buddha goes on to say, prepared to. Well, that they, they are not um, attracted to uh, looking at this ground. And he uses an expression, tana, which is borrowed directly from the, uh, from the Brahmanic tradition, meaning the Godhead. 
But then the Buddha explains that the tamo that he's talking about, the ground he's talking about, is the ground of dependent arising. In other words, it's a groundless ground. There is, he's just talking about the ground based on total flux. And I think that uh, if you look at the way in which that expression has been constantly reinterpreted to bring it back to the Brahmanical sense of a ground being you know, some sort of transcendent state. And so I think if you could go through a lot of those, uh, a lot of those quotations and look for the irony and the metaphor that the Buddha was obviously a master of, uh, as Gombrich shows, uh, and see that uh, he's not talking about transcendence at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for first of all, okay, a few comments in there. First of all, yes, Tana, but then Tana just means, just like literally, ground or standing place. I mean, it's, it's probably the second most common root in the Pali or Indic languages. It's very difficult to, to trace any specific, you know, relationship there. Secondly, is, is Tana used in that sense in the Upanishads? Mm, uh, it would be convincing, but anyway, maybe it is. But, but, but just to come back to, to the first point, I think, and I think, uh, look, that, that's all fair enough, right? Yes, the Buddha used irony, he used metaphor, he played with the traditions, he reformed them, he engaged with people, absolutely all of that stuff's no doubt about that. And that's, I think, a very vital and a very important part of the reinvigoration of the Buddhist tradition that you get from the modernist project, where you see these more kind of human characteristics emerging through the Buddha rather than, uh, you know, the, the kind of the more kind of exalted sort of psychic power Buddha that we get from more traditional accounts. So I don't have any problem with that generally, but um, I just want to keep pulling you back to the point which you, I think you glossed over earlier. And I, I made the point that, that you know, text-critical grounds don't support that particular model which you said. And so you responded by saying, well, you know, the Pali Canon was assembled over a long period of time and we can't rely on it. Yes, we, we, we know that. That's why we use text-critical studies, which can, in certain cases, lead us to a more or less probable way of reading the texts. Text critical studies is often decried, but the fact is that the basic model that was established by the first generation of Indologists in the late 19th century has actually held up remarkably well. And in, in, a sen in essence, we still use that today. We still think that the suttas are basically the earliest thing we've got from the Dhamma, not all the suttas are of equal age. Vinaya is a bit later, and Abhidhamma is later again, and so on. That basic model has actually stood up the test of time very well. Uh, and if we read out using the methods of text critical studies, yes, it's very true that those text critical studies will show that many things found within the tradition are quite incorrect. Okay, no doubt about that. It's 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 a it can be quite revolutionary in its implications. But not in this particular case, okay? In the particular case that we mentioned about where is the Buddha actually enlightened or not, that doesn't support, I don't believe, that that supports that kind of conclusion. I think the text-critical approach would, in fact, support the opposite conclusion. And so this is one of the, the, the bugbears that I have with the, the secular Buddhist approach, is that they use these kind of ideas of rationality and so on and so forth, historical inquiry and so on, very selectively, and when it will support their point of view, then they use it. Otherwise, then you say, "Oh well, we can't really trust the party canon." So, uh, well, you know, could, who knows? Uh, this comes back to the uh, sort of what seems to me to be um, uh, the, the common accusation of cherry picking. There is no, you know, there's no doubt that there is no way uh, you can't you can call it cherry picking. No matter what tradition it is, uh, you know, the, the five or six uh, Nikayas are vast literature without stacking on the linear, and then, of course, um, if one looks wider afield to the canonical literature of the Mahayana and so on. Uh, so everybody cherry picks. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, there is obviously uh, in institutionalised religious Buddhism a cherry picking going on to pick out all those uh, all those quotes that support a view of 
salvation and transcendence. Uh, and so what, I guess, secular Buddhism is doing, it, it's not about rationality, it's really about looking for um, uh, a concept of the human condition. You know? um, what is going on here that informs uh, informs us about the human condition and its possibilities? And I guess, you know, my, my one of the things that really strikes me is in the very first discourse, uh, there, there is no talk about transcendence except at the end when there's a sort of hallelujah chorus. Um, but and the Buddha is presenting uh, the middle way and the four noble truths. Uh, is, it is all about the human condition and about how one practices wisdom. Can you just comment a little bit further on interpretation, selective interpretation? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, you're quite correct that you know we, we, you have to select things. There's this great story by um, uh, Borges, the, the Argentinian writer. I think it's called the Aleph. I don't know if you've read that story. It's about a point through the universe, which through which you can see every other point of the universe simultaneously. Right. And, uh, uh, the, the, and the great tragedy of it, it was discovered by, uh, by a poet who proceeded to describe everything, mm. yeah? and who put everything down, and of course it spent years and years and years and years describing one back fence on a particular house, <laughs> and we're still going. So yes, of course we have to cherry pick things, yeah? we have to choose things, and we all have our means, and yes, you're quite right. And I think this is one big problem with the traditions, is that the traditions will say, I mean, a classic one we see in the case of women's ordination all the time, the, 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 the question of the Garudamas, and you know, does, a, does a, a nun who's been ordained for 100 years have to bow to a monk who's ordained that very day? And uh, uh, the, 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 you know, many of people, including myself, think that, that that's uh, you know, a later introduction to the, the veneer and so on and so forth, and there are very good text critical reasons for supporting that. But we were kind of criticised for you know chopping things out of the veneer and so on and so forth. Whereas the reality is that the way that the sangha practices ignores whole books of the veneer, and the whole, the whole veneer is built on a democratic, consensual, transparent <coughs> process of decision making, which has precisely nothing to do with actually how things are done most of the time in most some most monastic sanghas, most in most of the world. So I, I, I you know definitely agree with that perspective, everyone cherry picks. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's, it's also not, it's not just about that kind of random cherry picking. There are guidelines you're using, but I think we're coming, I mean, I'm, I'm coming to a better sense of you know, what you're coming in from. Of course, text critical approach is, is just a, it's just an academic theoretical approach. All, all it is is a way of reading things in order to, to try to fill, it doesn't solve any ultimate problems. All it can try to do is clarify, perhaps, how we look at the text in some ways. It can solve some kinds of problems. Uh, but w w what I think that most of us do, not limited to secular Buddhism, but I think most of us do, is that we, because we're looking to our scriptures for meaning, ultimately, and yeah, we're, not, we're not reading them as linguists or academics, and we maybe use those tools to help us, but we're ultimately looking to it for meaning. So we, 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 we bring ourselves into it. And we need to do that, right? Absolutely, that's no, no question about it. We need to bring ourselves and see ourselves in those scriptures yeah, in, our, in relationship with them. And that's where the interesting things start to happen. But, but I think that there also needs to be a, a discipline about the way that that's done. And this is something which I think sometimes is, is lacking in that secular Buddhist approach, so it tends to be, I think, erring too far on that, that thing of, at the one hand, saying, you know, we're being very modern and rational and everything, and on the and, but at the same time, making a lot of claims about the, the scriptures, which I don't think are really, uh, are certainly not things which I've seen produced by say, more, 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 more objective or more academic text-critical scholars, right? So you don't find people who are just pure linguists or something coming up with these same kind of conclusions. 
Well, yeah, I mean, um, there's a problem with rigor, you know, it eventually ends up in rigor mortis. And uh, that can be a bit of a, you know, one can stare oneself blind on the texts. And to come back to the point you were, you were talking about, it has, we have to decide what this means for us. And uh, there's often a kind of a trivialization of uh, cultural difference. You know, people say, oh, you know, you can call this a cultural accretion or not. But what is important, I think, to understand is that our culture, which includes our native language, is really the operating system uh, of our human minds. And uh, we have to look at uh, a body of literature like uh, the Silta Pitika. And uh, so what does it actually mean for us? And one gets to a point, you know, one can okay, argue the toss about whether uh, the Buddha was being ironical and metaphorical when he was uh, seemed to be referring to transcendence or not. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have to decide to do do you know, if there is any reason to believe in some sort of residual referencing of the transcendental, whether that actually means anything to us. And I guess um, the point about for secular Buddhists, um, given their usually uh, Western roots, is uh, no, those uh, references to transcendence or rebirth or whatever it is really don't make any sense. It's not, it just doesn't, um, they just don't fit into the reality construct that, uh, that our operating system gives us. We could, of course, completely reacculturate and decide, okay, we don't want to be as, you know, uh, Western uh, Australians with Western backgrounds or whatever it is, um, and we'll completely turn out, you know, we'll, we'll rework ourselves as Thais or something like that with that kind of um, culture, language and reality construct. And I think a lot of people do that. Um, I think particularly, you know, people who take up Tibetan Buddhism in Western places do that. Um, but um, I really wonder um, what the use of it is. But whether it is of any use or not, uh, the point is I think that most people uh, want a a spiritual practice and a set of concepts around that spiritual practice that they can actually relate to.